Welcome back, fellow armchair generals. This is Gamer1745 here, with my continuing playthrough of Hearts of Iron 3 with Black Ice 8 and Third Reich events. We're still shifting and moving forces, a huge stack here, getting them unstacked so that we can do some reorganization. For the eventual invasion of the US. And since part of the you know, mechanized good part of the army was already in Britain instead of withdrawing them, I'm just moving more in there. Okay, divisional HQs. Those would represent the HQs of the divisions themselves. And click the right button, it would help, of course. And so we've gotten more efficient in that. We will stop forward research at the moment. Not that there's a lot of good benefit. There is within this tech. The big one for me is delay between tax reduced with 10 hours. And we've had a uprising here in the swamps. Probably won't be worth much of a fight. But we'll see what um, that minor, very minor, likely. Do we need the others we dealing with? Yep, no real experience to be gained, but oh well. Do what we can. Send these guys back in to occupy. Okay, energy, of course you may have. Romania, no. Nanjing, Nan, Nanjing, I should say, government of China, you don't get any. Because, um, obviously it's this colored unit. Some of them are Japanese or an origin. Some of them are Chinese that are probably pretty pathetic, but, um, I don't see you know the periodically there's been outbreaks of rebellion and Japanese directly because we can see the green versus yellow on uh, Japan isn't necessarily garrisoning it well um, outbreaks in there you're not going to see any outbreaks and unless we're going to bring them into the war with Soviets at some point they're likely not to face any of the enemies. They're just an occupation army, and since they're not revolting, or likely to revolt. Italy is similarly in the same situation in that it's mostly an interior. They have moved their navy out, or a good chunk of their navy out here to help protect Gibraltar, which is nice. But it's mostly now interior line. Okay, how are we doing out here? Don't think there's a high casualty figure from this invasion. Mostly the replacements are going for the tremendous firepower. But we're just not making headway. Now maybe this is with some of our long range transports 
We can bypass this up here, but... I would like to get it, and since we're not really going to go into the U.S. until the good season, we have time to get there if we can. Not rushed. Okay, supply production. Now that helps with everything. But obviously we need to produce supplies, but... And everything just about uses supplies. So reducing the cost there makes everything else cheaper, more efficient. Okay, assault ships so till us have advanced. How far in the red are we? Quite a ways. Lotel is 44. Well, we'll cancel it for the moment. Just because I've shifted so much over here to deal with adding officers to the artillery. Oh, good. They've arrived finally. Okay, well. We're going to send them down to here. To the car court. These guys over to here. And the police deep into here. And look at the revolt risk. And this is only so low because these guys are here, which they're gonna leave. Shortly, so let's see. Let's look there for them. Let's see how many we can get these guys over here. Okay, spotting advanced. Does that mean better training for spotters, or does that mean better Zeiss binoculars? Don't know, but... or both. Okay, Afghanistan is mobilizing an army. Nice, but... At least at the moment, unnecessary. Some of our cool Jaeger units. Oh, these are getting too big. Okay, well, we'll at least get these guys going down here. Rebase. And we'll send these guys up to pick up the rest of them. Okay, now back over to Celebi. So we... oh, hold it, hold it. I don't want to lose that now. Okay, these guys are much better organized. They're still too far away, but whatever. No, wrong one, wrong one, wrong one. I want you on airplanes. That's the wrong airplanes. Oh, 
Okay, last time I made the mistake in the now uncommentaried version, I parachuted right into a Manab or whatever that is. Oh no, I'm. Manando. Manando. Parachuted right into Manando. Um, which, if it's still being held the same, has a Marine. Um, U.S. Marine Division right in there, and that didn't go so well. So we're going to parachute into here first. Yep, learn from mistakes. I just saw that originally seen it. It was did some overflight. Saw that it was brown. Just thought it was going to be like another British garrison here. Oh well. Okay. Now. Let's unload these for the moment. And we're going to fly in supplies. A lot of those are ships. So as soon as we can get them supplied here, yay. This guy's going to support the attack. Commander decision making advance. Okay, that would be better officer warfare training, naval warfare training schools improvements. Okay. I try to think about because, you know, we call these texts, and that's generally sort of what we think of them as are. And these are obviously texts. These are, you know, a, a new bomb or something else. But um, doctrines also, and news leadership. But I try to look, get behind the idea that what they're creating. Now, obviously, a lot of them, yeah, they just increase organization. Or they just do something else like that. And you already have two or three other things that may not increase it as much or may increase it more. Um, that have a different name. But I'm trying to look at the reason behind, behind it and why... Um, say the Italian Navy is different than the American Navy. Um, some of that reason is technological, some of it is doctrines, some of it is skill sets. And so it's not just, oh, look at the ships, you have equal um, heavy guns on them or something like that. So they should be equal. Mm, that isn't how it worked out. And so it's how to make the armies Navy's Air Force is different. Okay, this time we won easier and better than last time. So now we've, unless, and the, well, the AI does not do um, naval air, or not naval, but air supply, unfortunately. So these troops will start losing their supply rather quickly. And once we get here, we will connect our supply lines to it. There we go. Give them a day or two. Now we'll build some radar. I think that'll be enough. A couple of radars though. Look out into the sea a little ways. So far, we've not had interference here. Not sure why this is, because I have seen the AI come out. Maybe it's just been random happenstance, but I, it has appeared in the past that 
the AI does at times identify um, enemy fleets and sends out a fleet to inter, you know, interdict it to, to attack it. And I don't know whether this is just too far away from an American base or if all the American fleet is out in the Pacific somewhere, you know, one of the big, you know, death stacks of is it all just sitting in Honolulu as a big, you know, huge navy and it just too far away. Don't know. But my, well, my whole point, of course, is to avoid combat with the American Navy, even to a degree to avoid um, air attacks on it, because it once gives a huge um, stack like that. It seems to just get the air units as well. Deny it ports. Take away its support. Much like we've done to the British Navy so far. Because, yes, yeah, some of the British Navy has been in and around here. Now's the time, I think, to build the... We'll go from Pola. We have seen, like here, we have seen, uh, you're in the way. Oh, we'll just moved, okay. Well, it was here. We... Okay, extra wide tank tracks. Yes, the Germans did in a way do those. As I think I've talked about this before in this series. Um, may have been the last one, may have, but probably when we were talking in Russia or there about the Tiger tank and that it's not so much that their tank tracks were were super wide. They were fairly wide. Now they're dealing with, um, as one I saw a modern U.S. tanker talking about the M1 um, uh, Abrams tank. They roll on tracks, and that's why it's a, such a smooth ride um, for them. And part of what that means is, is that the wheels that you got you got to think about the tank track don't think so much about in some ways the tank track spinning around which of course it does but think about the tank um, wheels that are rolling on the tracks so the tracks themselves are um, if you will momentarily um, I know it's not really the case, but sort of apparently um, stationary. And the wheels are just passing over it. So that, and the tracks are in a way in that they come down, they get to go stationary on the ground. And they stay in that one place as the tank rolls over it. And then that they pick it, pick it back up as it goes. So it disperses the weight. And I know a lot of you already know this. Um, so instead of a few, like, four points or eight points of weight that you get like in an armored car it's dispersed so the wider the track helps on dispersal and the Tiger was a very heavy tank now the Tiger had its wide or its interleaved road wheel system which um, isn't very good because if it was so good not that it didn't have it, some of its bonuses it did it was trying to disperse its weight um, you would see it widely used today, and you don't see um, the interleaf um, wheel system. And I hope you understand it, in which the wheels sort of overlap each other, and they were multiple thin wheels. To get it on, um, not so much to get it on the um, railway cars themselves, but to, to drive for the railways to go through 
um, railway tunnels and bridges that were, you know, only a certain amount of wide width with um, a girder system on the bridge or, of course, obviously the width of the tunnel. The Tiger was too wide, so they made special tracks that were a narrower track that you would take off the outer set of the road wheels. You'd have to do this. Every time you put them on a, on a train, you would take off the outer set of road wheels, remove the tracks, put on the narrower set of tracks, draw, and this just to drive, drive the tank up onto the flatbed of the car, railway car, and then... Um, Obviously, store the extra wheels in the track somewhere on the train. Take the train to wherever you're going to go. Drive the tank right off the tr um, the train, and then you remove the the tracks and put on the other ones, and then put the wider road wheels on it, or one of steps in one order or the other, like that. And you'd have to do that every time you moved it via train. And the Germans did not have, and you can look at, and I've recently got some pictures of uh, tank carriers for um, like Panzer 1s and Panzer 2s in which one version was a truck that had sort of a, a flat bed on it in which you would drive the tank up, I presume on ramps, up onto the um, flat bed of the truck and then it had another trailer behind it which was much more lower slung in the tank. Might have just been able to drive right up onto the... right up onto the um, trailer bed without having to go up too much of in the way of ramps. Uh, and so you could much more efficiently, quickly drive a couple of tanks, and those were Panzer 1s or 2s. But the Germans did not have that option with something like the Tiger in which you could, um, at least not I've ever seen a picture of, in which you could put a um, tank on a um, flatbed to, um, you know, drive it with a truck to get it somewhere. You had to drive it at its slow, tigery pace. So, yes, game designers, your tiger divisions, your heavy tank divisions, should be slow strategically because you had to either SR them via the railway or you had to drive them slowly down the road. Um, standard recovery practice, um, and again, I'm because the Germans use so many um, numbers as part of the names of types. The heaviest of the prime mover half tracks, not the armor type, the ones, the, he the heaviest types that you would use for towing the Flak 18, the Flak 36, whatever, the, the 80, 88 millimeter um, anti-aircraft guns, and some of the other, the heaviest type, which is heavier than the standard ones that move the, um, the 88 millimeter anti-aircraft guns, the heaviest type of those was the standard towing mechanism for a Tiger tank, particularly if you're pulling it out of a, um, you know, stuck position, you know, it's, it's easier to roll it down a road than it is to um, pull it out of a, a ditch or somewhere that it got stuck was to use two of those hooked together to pull a tiger tank out of something else to recover it so if you've had a tiger tank that's been damaged in the field whether it's the suspensions are you know hit by enemy fire so that it can't just quickly fix it where it is or the engine is damaged or just you want to recover it to scrap the vehicle because there's good steel in there to, to scrap it you had to get a couple of these prime movers to get that thing to, to, to haul it anywhere to tow it. And so it, and those, those things aren't that fast themselves. So towing these things, these behemoths around. And that's the only way to get it back to even to a field repair shop. So you had to do that. And if you wanted to, and if the tank wasn't drivable, you'd have to tow it up onto the flatbed, you know, put on the, the, you know, road wheel changes and tow it up there and so tiger tank heavy tank the, obviously the tiger 2 is even heavier um, not sure that it's any wider I, and I don't know if they had a similar I don't specifically remember seeing us reading about a similar track width variant for the um, tiger 2 and moving it and obviously the mouse was super heavy that was so he so so heavy it wouldn't go across many of the bridges 
including railway bridges because they're just too wide, too big. So since it, um, they needed to move it once in a while, you know, there was a th thought of that, that you weren't just going to build it at the factory and use it to defend the factory that it was built at. You had to literally move it once in a while. Um, it was so difficult to move and slow that it, even any sort of road grade was almost too, you know, going up was almost too much for for that thing. And then it crawled up at like 5 or 10 miles an hour, some ridiculously slow speed. But when it got to rivers, um, it was sort of an interesting tank design by Ferdinand Porsche in which um, I think it was four, maybe mistaken, four electric engines or something like that that drove the tank itself. I think I'm remembering all this correctly. And so, um, and not the gasoline-powered engine in, in it that it moved it, if I'm thinking correctly on this. I hope I am. I mean, I didn't plan on any, saying any of this. And so you had the, um, the gasoline-powered engine would turn a... Um, you know, dynamo to, to generate electricity, and that electricity would in turn drive, um, would go to uh, four smaller engines at, you know, the sprocket places to turn the, you know, the, the, the tracks. And so it worked fairly well, and it was, instead of using a, um, a transmission system, um, which... The final, you're, if you remember some of the debates on the Hearts of Iron 4 forum about the Panther and its reliability, well, its primary problem was sort of in the final drive breaking down, and that's sort of from, not the engine, it was sort of, you know, how the, um, through the transmission, I'm not a mechanic, sorry, um, but the transmission transmitting the, the power to the final elements to turn the wheel, in there that there were... Um, weaknesses in the system that they were they made as light as possible uh, that they were with the materials that they had and I say with the materials that they had because things like titanium weren't generally available and other things but and so there were weak points with the and some of it might just be quality of metal and lack of tungsten to mix in with the, the steel that could have made this the exact same design reliable if you made it stronger but it had its problem in the final drive system through the transmission. So transmitting all that power and generally just the two of the road wheels to move the mouse was just going to be more and more heavy steel to have to do this by using the dispersed architecture of the um, electric engines. You were able to do it um, somewhat effect effectively. Well, the mouse, like I was saying, was too heavy to go over most bridges in Germany. Some of those, of course, are what I would, what maybe a lot of people would call streams, in which you know are six, eight feet deep or something that um, wouldn't be that big of a problem just to drive through them. You have to prepare the bank on either side, make it a you know the steepness that you can go down and then up it, because it, the mouse wasn't very. Um, uh, we're just saying climbability wasn't very good with the tank. So, but then there were also a lot of um, other larger rivers, as we can see the ones basically on this map here. We'll go to the nice, pretty map here. Um, you know, all these ridge rivers. Now, some of the big main bridges across the Rhine and wherever may very well be able to support the mouse, and the mouse could drive over them. But you can't, one, rely upon the bridges being intact. And two, maybe where you need to go over it, where let's say the bridge was here in this city, that may not be where you need to go across the river. You may need to go across somewhere here. Well, the way they did that was is they made the tank, or at least, you know, they never really put any production. They have a few pre-production models. But the idea was is to make it um, airtight and that you'd have to, um, has, like they did with some of the... Um, these, the early Tiger 1s, um, 
special um, things to you know tighten up all the intake air intakes and seal the tank up. And so you would seal the tank up. You would have um, you know a snorkel thing that would float on top of the river, and because of the type of um, situation you in the earlier experimentation, the Germans found that it wasn't um, very effective or very easy to do the um, do the snorkel thing for the intake and the exhaust on a on a you know gasoline or diesel engine to get it across the river, especially if you're fully submerging the tank, and that gets harder and harder to do. So what they did was is you you took two mouses to get across some river that it was too deep for to just normally drive across. One mouse would seal itself up, and they would run a, a, a cable back to the other mouse. It would sit on the side of the river, and it would run its engines to power the electrical engines in the um, tank to get it across the river. See, it was a hybrid. See, the Germans, they were going hybrid. They believed in global warming. They were, they were with you lefties. They thought global warming was evil. Not quite, but okay. Um, so they're they're hybrid. Um, so they would use the electricity on, of generated by one just sitting on the bank to get a get the tank one tank across the river, and then that tank would unseal itself and get ready to to work again. And they would seal up the other one, and then the one that's on you know already made it across would power the other one to get to the other side so that they were feeding the power back and forth with the engine. So that's how they were, they, you, you couldn't get just one, and again, they never did this because they never left the factory with them other than to some testing ground, which I presume, because I've seen them in some of the testing ground with a dummy, you know, heavy-weighted dummy turret on, I presume is very near the factory um, that they were building them on. Um, but that the, the theory was, is the practice was to use that to get them across rivers including internally in Germany, or if, you know, if you're going to win the war in 1945 with these new super tanks, and you're going to have to re go back into Russia with these super tanks um, to get across any significant body of water. That's how they were going to have to move these things across the water. And since it was it was literally too heavy for the railroad, too, too big, too wide, so you'd have to drive them. And think about a... 1940s Porsche hybrid engine and its potential or likely reliability factor. How many miles can you go? Now again, it's you know it's a hybrid, so you're using the engine to to to, to generate electricity to drive electric motors. But I don't know how well those electric motors are going to be for reliability. You know, how far are you going to, you know, how many maintenance stops are you going to have? And not just your sort of daily tank maintenance check and make sure the oil and the transmission fluid type things are all, all working right and making sure the tank um, tracks suspensions are appropriate, but proper rebuilds and refits are you going to get. So the mouse is just super silliest ridiculousness that um, just doesn't work now. A mo you know, you can look at the weight of an M1 Abrams, it's getting heavy, but obviously we now have the technology to move something that heavy, and things have changed. So that's just my sort of diatribe on super heavy tanks, and started at the basis of a wide, tra wide track development, I know. Okay, so we did stop that. Okay, light cruiser escort roll. We're going to leave that because we're wanting to get to the Carrier Task Force tech, so we're only a little bit into the red. Hope I got the details right, and this is one of the reasons I list, I um, formally call this a historical commentary because I don't claim in my, um, again, as I said in other episodes when I'm putting um, information into the mod I'm looking it up I'm double checking it yes Wikipedia or wherever else that I'm checking it up the books they can be wrong so it can have bad history in it 
but I really there take the time to do my best to make sure the history is good and solid. This is commentary in that it sort of allows me to fudge things that I don't quite know the details on, and you're not expecting detailed facts, but it's also commentary as in it's my evaluation of history, whether it's evaluation of the effectiveness of the mouse or um, uh, political policies or diplomatic decisions. So the commentary label allows me to we're gonna build some on that. Are we two? Okay, we're gonna build a couple of more. Heavy transports. We'll need those or could use them, maybe not need them the right term. Allows me to um try to work from memory here and talk more commentary than reliability. So if you want more details on wide track German tanks, road wheels and such, or more details on the mouse, go look it up for yourself, but you get the general idea. Okay. Attack oh well, let's have Sussman also attack. Sort of waiting for it. Oh, there's the Japanese torpedo boats displacing them. some of the force here. We have. Oh, didn't, I thought I had a. Oh, here it is. Of course, I thought I had because I did have more proper escorted fleet. So we're going to move over reinforcements to help. One thing that I know, because um, when I grew up, I still have a nice set of encyclopedias that are way out of date, but, um, well, maybe I should have looked at Japan, I don't know. Um, yeah, we'll give you energy. They may have wanted energy. Um, and I got a large collection of books on the bookshelves. And I always did sort of kind of think, why do I need to learn some of the um, times tables? And now with um, oh, I don't want to use that fleet. Now with autocorrect. that fleet. Auto correction for spelling. Why do you need to spell words? And yeah, there's reasons to know times tables and that with calculators. But there is less of a reason. And you might think, why do you need to know history when it's, if you want to know something, just go, you know, get on your smartphone Oh, we'll rebase there, at least temporarily. Go get on your smartphone and look it up quickly. Then you carry it with you. That's true, but you need to... Something probably just... Thing that I want to deploy, maybe? Um, not so much, okay. Well, these guys, yes, we want to deploy those. Get them upgrading to whatever the current standard is. Um, and that's quite true. Like, I could be pausing and... And wouldn't be a bad idea. I'm quickly looking this stuff up on Wikipedia. But you sort of kind of need to know what to look up when. Man, I'm glad the Japanese took this. I didn't notice that they had. I presume they've taken that as well. No, they haven't taken the Northern Andaman Islands. Or I would have called this whole thing the Andaman Islands, but okay. Um, you got to sort of know what what to look up. 
if you know what I mean. So I do sort of agree to some to some level. You don't need to know all the details of history and memorize like all the dates and all the facts. You know, X number of artillery were used in such and such battle or X number of tanks were fought at, you know, Kursk or something like that. Now, if you're writing an article or a paper, you sort of need to be able to look that up and have that correct. But so long as you know that Kursk is a major tank battle and you want to find out some facts about it, you know where to start looking and you know what to start looking for. And so that's sort of the, you need the framework. If not all the details. Have we got to jet fighters yet? No, how close are we to jets? I'll keep clicking the wrong spot. We're going to go up to technology. Jets, okay. So, well. Somewhere in here. Well, there it is, okay. Not too long. Okay, all of the additional men for the artillery has not taken too much, but has taken a big chunk of our manpower. Got a couple of Uber Marine divisions coming. And our nuclear reactor. Soon. Okay, and some more motor torpedo boats. Help along our subs that are in production a little bit. Those are small manpower usage. A few more assault ships. Oh, okay, we just had a... Oh, okay, we just had a major, major fight here. Whoa, well, 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 well. As I was just postulating, well, whatever happened to the American fleet? Well, those um, 41, 40, and 43, I think, are like um, destroyer squadrons. They're the Americans there. They're still operating. Okay. Well, um... Since I don't want to lose any more for um, Greenland right now, of my very precious German fleet, we're going to okay, yeah. Now we're going to stop the invasion, and we're going to head back to Iceland. Rebase, uh, rebase to Iceland. Good. Don't think we lost anything significant, including a bunch of transports. I mean, if we lost, if if we if I fully fold up on transports and we lose, I mean, on units and we lose transports, we start losing battalion or brigades and whatnot, which of course would be messy and expensive. I don't really care about losing landing craft, you know, in and of themselves. They're fairly cheap and easy to make. Um, well, destroyer, destroyers I start to care about, and of course I very much care about capital ships and good proper divisions. So, well, we've had an, uh, a close encounter uh, with the Americans there. So, this is Mark Nisenau, Sharn Horse. Yeah, it looks like they're mostly ex destroyer squadrons. And Okay, well that was interesting. Very interesting. 
Oh, we're looking for elite commando unit defense. Is that one here? Yeah. Okay, well. Let's see. Do we have some text here like capital fire ship control that we should increase to better battle? Maybe. At least fortunately that wasn't some big doom stack that would have killed us. Maybe even been in like an anti-submarine patrol type situation. Okay, we're gonna start rethinking going after Greenland with a naval invasion. Because as you can see, we uh, the reason that that's down is just because of the artillery um, superior firepower tech massively. And we're going to increase even more of those. Salt ships, these will have longer range. I'm not sure that we need it more than the um, landing craft. But what we're going to see about hoping to do is get from here to here. And be able to invade fast enough to keep anything more serious than what we just had as a fairly light skirmish. And let's see, we're going to do a another carrier air group. Just in case we lose this one. Okay, it isn't displaying, but there is a, at least there should be down there. Carrier air group. Yes, load up. Load up. Base. Okay, how's our revolt list risk looking? Okay, well we have the these guys down here, and you know, it'll take a while for the effects of the units that are just leaving to fully leave the occupied Vichy zone. I still don't think Vichy has any, or Spain either, has any transports because they're. I don't know if they're still migrating through here. The, they were shifting forces all the way around through here just to get back and forth here a while ago. So I don't even know if they can get additional forces down here if they wanted to. So we'll help them out. Okay, airplane radio communication, which is, of course, nice. Yeah, we're... Yeah, just now getting out of the red. But I did want to get that proof capital ship. And cheaper than that. We're going to get some more naval bombers. Naval bombers can't reach where we want to go. But once we sort of kind of get there, we can at least try to dominate things. I'm looking at this map. Hmm. I wonder if it might be easier to go from the Azores. We might be going after the Azores here. They're fairly well garrisoned. Because that might be quicker to Newfoundland than Iceland. My plot was. Now, I don't know if it... Because we can look at here. Analyze this a little bit. The weather here. Frozen 100%. So that... Um... Yeah, obviously, I yeah, um, I know it's Arctic, and I know we're we're dealing with that, but that is, well, why we had ski units and such in the invasion force and not regular armor, but maybe come summer. 
but we'll also see about going after the Azores maybe next year. Maybe even with nearly the same invasion unit. They've got some coastal defenses and such, so we'll see about that. Okay, rated guard, radar, blah, 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 blah. Radar guided bombs. Well, has advanced, but actually just for us, just happened. Okay, so we're going to stop that now, obviously, because we're pushing too far forward on it. Um... Don't... I know that they're, they were doing some radar-guided bombs and radar-guided missiles. So the ones that I'm particularly thinking of, the Germans were doing. Um, one of them may have been a bomb, but it was sort of a glide bomb, meaning you launched it out of an aircraft and it had wings and it glided. Uh, though I think it had like a flare in the back of it or something, so you could s so the flare would show up. Um, and you would um, watch the flare because it was bright and like to shoot it, take out a ship. And so you, and it was wire connected to wire, or no, maybe that one was, um, no, I think that one was um, radio operated, not wire. Yeah, from again, I'm remember trying to remember all these things from various documentaries I've seen, and so the if you had no air cover over the ships, whatever ships they were, um, which is obviously bigger ships with bigger anti-aircraft guns, you're further away, but they're bigger targets. They could come up with a standard German bomb or launch one of these glide bombs from fairly high altitudes, and you know, sort of like a, a small V1, if you will, um, rocket, but not but not a rocket motor, but just short, stubby wings on it. And so it would glide down into it, and it had a, like a, a flare, if I'm remembering quickly. So you'd look through your um, visual scope, you'd see the bright flare at the rear of it, and you would send, um, using a joystick, you'd send, um, you know, instructions over the radio to to hit hit a ship, and a fairly big bomb, and could really damage the ship outside of um, the air distance. Well. Um, Obviously, the U.S. often had um, air cover, so if you had any sort of fighter-level air cover, you'd mess it up because, um, although you may, depending on on the level of, of how the air combat's going, you may or may not be able to um, shoot the f bombers down reliably. But you're not necessarily you you keep you get the aircraft to to fly in such a way that the bombardier can't follow the, you know, the guide the bomb in through manual control all the way into the the target because if they're dodging or flying in different directions from attacking aircraft, it becomes harder. So you had that problem, but that was sort of an, an early version thing. And then the U.S., as they figured out what was going on, um, figured out how to just jam it and put, would be able to turn on a jammer. Now it would, I think, jam a lot of their um, radio communication but once they saw a bomber of an appropriate, you know, twin engine type of, of the Germans in, in the proper range, they could flip on the jammer, which would jam um, the, the um, radio signals to, f to fly the bomb. So the bomb would, ver I mean, be almost impossible to, to hit it because, it, you know, you really had to constantly adjust it. It wasn't a straight gl glide path. The other thing I'm thinking of was is and that's why I've done this, and I gave some bonuses to some of these here techs um, early on with the the TV um, technology that Germany was doing before the war. They also, if I'm again remembering correctly, this was more of a, a rocket or missile. And this was a wire guided, again, a, a very thin wire type guided system. Um, so it limited its range, but it had a TV camera in the nose of the um, the bomb or rocket. I think this is more of a rocket. And so they would again at a stand, good standoff range launch this and it would power and go fairly quickly into a ship. These are generally generally um, for the cost of the the system you weren't using these to, to take out one tank on the eastern front 
you are using them for high value targets. So um, it was, you know, wire guided and that jamming didn't work, but it's sort of expensive and sort of limited um, range and a bit more limited range because you got to, you know, how many, how, how long of a wire are you going to have? And so, but it, you would be able to look, get the signal back of the picture of the, um, you know, sh the, the ship and you just fly it straight into it. I don't really think the Germans were doing, um, in, for, these are for um, air launched, if I'm understanding correctly, because of what they affect here. Really doing too much in the way of radar guided stuff in the war. So the U.S. were working on some of this stuff. I don't know if that they ever got too far in it, but we're doing some research. So I'm sort of thinking, again, these are more of them, if not exactly radar guided, but electronically guided smart weapons, because that's what we're talking about. We're talking about smart weapons. Because you can see the, you know, the first Gulf War, um, the American version of the first Gulf War, as opposed to the Iran-Iraq Gulf War. Um, you know, the um, flying in of, you know, the, you know, the, the missiles or the bomb, the JDAMs, video of them going right in their target. That was started in World War II. It was not landing craft flotillas have advanced. Not too far ahead on that, but we'll go back over to this. And since we still have, we've got all of those. Cruiser, okay, we want to do group there. Um, so what we were seeing in the 90s had already started in the mid to early 40s. And that is how advanced things were getting. Um, both, both, um, you know, really it was Germany, the U.S., with Britain just sort of hanging in there. And I don't want to diminish their their contributions because they were often some critical element con um, contributions. But generally speaking, they didn't have the infrastructure to, um, you know, obviously they did the radar chain home systems and such that really helped them out. But they were more a bit more stressed, as I like to put it try to do the research and development compared to the US so but they were also contributing to the overall technical warfare I think British were probably doing a bit more anti-submarine technical warfare development because that was critical to their survival okay well thanks for watching this episode I really do appreciate it um, thanks for liking the videos as well um, please continue to post your comments um, they help enrich the series because I know a lot of people will just watch the videos but those who want further information please look down in the comment section because I'm happy if when I don't remember the technical name of a, of a radar guided bomb or program or something like that and one of you guys wants to look that up and give links to Wikipedia or whatever. I'm very happy to have you give value-added service to the series. So thanks so much. See you next time.